Adult human detective Batman. Adult human detective Batman. Adult human detective Batman. He lives in a bat cave because he's Batman. The following is an in-depth story analysis and retrospective. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before listening to this review. Batman and the Ninja Turtles go together like beer and pizza. I'll leave it to you to decide which is the beer and which is the pizza. The comparisons are obvious. They're both urban properties, both get around jumping on rooftops, both are adept at martial arts, sometimes Batman is as much a ninja as the Turtles, both often fight ninjas, both are ostensibly well-disciplined and trained to be masters of invisibility. Both heavily rely on gadgetry, much of which they create themselves, or in the case of the Turtles, Donatello does. They both have a tendency to put their brand on their cool stuff. They both drive iconic vehicles. Both operate out of subterranean layers. Both deal with supernatural and alien threats, but are best known for their street-level adventures. Their arch nemeses are their opposite in personality. Shredder is dead serious, while the Turtles are driven by a sense of humor, and vice versa for Batman and the Joker. And they're two of the most toyetic properties ever conceived. As a kid, the two sets of action figures I had the most of and played with most often were Batman and the Ninja Turtles, and I'm sure I came up with a dozen different scenarios to put them together, just like the crossover comics by James Tinian and Freddie Williams, and then this movie finally did. They were both late 80s, early 90s phenomenons, both in live action, on the big screen, and on television, and have continued to have a presence in both places on and off to varying results. I think it's interesting that Batman's success in animation started with a serious, sober effort, and then its second iteration was more cartoony and more absurd, while the opposite happened with the original 87 Turtles cartoon and then the 2003 series. That first show was sillier, the second more serious, and based more on the Mirage source material. And despite that flip of tones, both IPs enjoyed more success with their first series over the second. Or at least, those first series are more remembered and talked about, even if the 2003 Turtle show and the Batman were still plenty popular. Despite the fact that one is traditionally more serious and less tongue-in-cheek than the other, they've both bounced back and forth over the decades, even though Batman is a lot older, between silly and comedic versus gritty and hard-edged, and everything in between. I've always said there are a hundred or more different ways to do Batman without losing his basic identity that are all totally valid. And somehow, Ninja Turtles has proven itself perhaps as versatile. I think Batman and Ninja Turtles may be the most pliable superhero ideas ever created. We've had several meta-stories about this phenomenon for both now, which is another big thing they have in common. They're always meeting other versions of themselves, so we can compare and contrast different iterations and explore what Batman or the Turtles are at their core. It's a fun way to deconstruct them, despite how different each version might seem from the last. Batman Brave and the Bold couldn't get away from stories about Batman meeting other versions of himself from other universes, and Return of the Cape Crusaders was a love letter to the whole history of Batman, exploring the transformation on screen from campy to gritty through the lens of the 60s show. Ninja Turtles had Turtles Forever and the 87 cartoon crossover episodes of the 2012 show. It goes without saying, of course, that Ninja Turtles takes a lot of influences from Batman, even if, at its inception in the Mirage comics, it was a direct parody of Frank Miller's Daredevil, aping that visual style and cribbing concepts like the hand, which they jokingly turned into the foot. I don't mean to suggest all these comparisons are a happy accident. Eastman and Laird were huge Miller fans all the way around, so there's no doubt they were looking at the Dark Knight Returns in year one, as well as Daredevil and Ronin in the early days of the Turtles. But as Batman and TMNT became merchandising juggernauts, they each must have rubbed off on each other in subtle and not-so-subtle ways. It's like the relationship America and Japan have enjoyed since the occupation after World War II. Each culture keeps integrating and adapting from the other until it's hard to see where one idea or influence ends and another begins. And of course, Japanese pop culture itself influences the Ninja Turtles and Batman both quite a bit. 
There's such a natural fit that DC and Nickelodeon keep coming up with excuses to put them together. There have been now not one but four crossover miniseries since 2015, a trilogy of stories that put together essentially the mainline versions from the mainstream DC continuity at the tail end of New 52 and Tom Waltz's IDW Turtles, and one that crosses the animated series version of Batman with the 2012 cartoon Turtles from its Amazing Adventures line, also published by IDW. But Injustice 2 also included the Turtles as DLC, so you can create those matchups now, and even with some of the same villains that appear in this movie and the comics, like Joker, Harley Quinn, and Scarecrow, in an official published AAA video game. And it's really good! The Turtles practically feel like they're part of the DC Universe right now, at least some of the time. I'm getting used to the idea of the Turtles as sometimes Batman characters. Yeah, they got a crappy live-action Saban series and got a crossover with the Power Rangers in the late 90s, but I never thought they'd get this kind of treatment. This was another one of those pinch-me-I-must-be-dreaming things I couldn't have imagined when I was a kid, like the 60s Batman animated movies starring Adam West, or a relatively serious ongoing Power Rangers comic, or a live-action Tick series with action set pieces and a serialized narrative like we got with Amazon. Sad that it got cancelled, but it was still amazing that it even happened. These days, we get so spoiled with crossover material, what with Ready Player One and Super Smash Brothers and both DC and Marvel film franchises chopping at the bit to do multiversal stories now, where every iteration of a character you've ever seen from those companies has the potential to show up on screen together that I'm getting a little numbed to it. Comics have crossed so many characters, it's hard to think of great mashups and team-ups I'm just desperate to finally see now that haven't already been done, ignoring quality because not everything's always handled well. The Turtles themselves have met tons of characters, especially big 80s and 90s icons in the IDW comics. And while it's still fun, the novelty has worn off on me a bit. Ghostbusters... X-Files, and it hasn't always been in-house. IDW teamed up recently with Boom to cross the Turtles with Power Rangers again, and this time it wasn't in space and didn't include nobody's favorite turtle, Venus. It was excessively gimmicky, though, with the Turtles morphing and Shredder having a Green Ranger suit, so it's exciting that DC has been willing to play nice with IDW and allow so much of these Turtles projects, because while they've had a history of crossovers with IDW, too, going back quite a long time, including Star Trek crossovers with the Legion of Superheroes and Green Lantern, you don't see as many from the big two as you used to and never, ever with each other anymore, unfortunately. When I was a kid, we had things like Batman Daredevil, Batman Punisher. As goofy as it was, I miss crazy stuff like DC vs. Marvel and Amalgam, and the one crossover that would truly blow my mind and make me a giddy schoolgirl is if they finally came back together to do a sequel to that insanity. Heck, while you're bringing back Dark Claw and Super Soldier and Doctor Strange Fate, get with IDW again. Throw the Ninja Turtles in there and cross them with the Fantastic Four. I've wanted that forever. I mean, it's right there. Recently, on an episode of my live stream series, The Captain Logan Show, someone asked how I define good fan service. I said the best fan service is a nod or a reference that's so well integrated into a piece. It makes the initiated smile and feel rewarded for paying attention, but the uninitiated never knows they missed anything. It's not effective if it completely relies on nostalgia and there's nothing else to grab onto. Or if the references are so obvious that even lay people unfamiliar with the material get it. Like, look up in the sky, it's Superman. You're not making anyone feel like a superfan for catching that one. I don't mean to be a prude about that, but you have to kind of walk a line between being accessible and inclusive and just being insulting. Batman v Superman falls into that trap, where I'm supposed to be tickled pink because I get to see Batman in his metal suit fight Superman like he does in The Dark Knight Returns, but the situation is preposterous and uninteresting by comparison, so I'm not smiling at this treat for the fans who get it so much as shaking my head at how self-indulgent and overly serious it is. But rewatching Batman vs Ninja Turtles, I realize I left out an important caveat fan service as the name of the game, as the substance of the piece, actually can work. 
It's similar to parody or melodrama. The rules are different, and it's for a more limited audience. I think it can actually be okay to make fan service the movie. You need more to latch onto, as I said, if the story is presented as an accessible traditional narrative that's for everyone. Ready Player One wouldn't have worked if I didn't kind of like the characters involved, but you can make a movie that's more like a theme park ride, a fun romp through a world you'd only enter if you were already familiar with a lot of the material, that's there to thrill and wow you before it's trying to tell a thought-provoking story or make any point about society or human beings. It doesn't have to be for everybody, and it doesn't have to change hearts and minds. But to make it work, I think it's got to follow three basic rules. A. Make it clear who the intended audience is right up front. B. Don't take yourself too seriously, but let the characters in the world play it totally straight. Unless it's also a total farce with a looser, non-existent internal logic. And C. Most importantly... It has to be clever with the references, show a lot of reverence for the material, operate at a high energy level, and have so much fun, you just don't care that it's not really about anything, besides the thing it's making its epic mixtape for. Because that's what Batman vs. Ninja Turtles is. It's an edible arrangement of Batman and Ninja Turtles lore. References, action, and atmosphere delivered for 85 minutes from fans to fans. That's what Turtles Forever did so well, as did the first two Batman Unlimited movies and the 60s Batman animated features. That's not to say you can't do both. Make a movie specifically for people who already love this stuff and tell a poignant or touching or tragic story. Or infuse it with a lot of fascinating subtext about whatever you wanted to underscore. Sometimes it's smarter to stay in your lane, but it's also possible to take up two lanes effectively at the same time. This movie is... On the surface, a story about four mutant turtles who show up in a city protected by a rich guy who dresses up as a bat, who think he is one of the bad guys, and then team up with him when they discover he isn't in order to fight a team up of actual bad guys who plot to use ooze to mutate all the city's citizens to tear the city apart. And there's not a lot under the surface. This story could have been about all kinds of things. What is a real family, besides people you're stuck with because you're related to them, like the 1990 Turtles movie was? It could be about real monsters versus perceived monsters. It could be about corruption and decadence and whether a destructive, reprehensible act is justified if it makes it possible to stamp out that corruption, like Ra's al Ghul's philosophy in Batman Begins. Here, Roz wants to destroy Gotham so he can rule it, and that's all we know. Who knows if he even has an ideology behind that goal. It could be about the benefits and drawbacks to rogue agents versus team players. And it could be about fathers and sons. I don't think there's anything wrong with there being a prerequisite to seeing a movie if it's clear what you need to come into this with. It's in the title. You need a little Batman, and you need a little Ninja Turtles. Maybe you'd have enough fun with it if you were a gigantic fan of just one or the other. This is a standalone universe, even though we're seeing two properties cross, so there's no material in this world that you have to look at first. It's not a sequel, but it's like a sequel, in that these characters are more or less the classic, generally accepted versions, and it's not going to spend a lot of time explaining who they are or where they come from. Yeah, kind of like the Arkham games. It's also not grossly complicated, to the point where you have to know every story these characters have ever been involved in, like the Aftermath story post-Shattered Grid in the Boom Power Rangers comics, Beyond the Grid, where I was lost with any character from a Power Rangers series I didn't watch a lot of. That felt like it was written for about 12 people. The prerequisite here isn't about knowledge, although that helps with the clever references, as much as it is about appreciation. And you certainly could make the story more substantial and sophisticated than this is, even aimed just at that audience. I think there are opportunities here for more complex character arcs and some deeper thematic exploration, which I'll talk about. But I may not have wanted that as much if I hadn't read the source material, which curiously does have more of that, even though it's still the weaker of the two pieces. And it's hard to be too frustrated about that, because yeah... It's all candy inside the wrappers, but what pretty and well-arranged wrappers. There's no pretense here. What you see is what you get. It's upfront about what it wants to be, and waste no time communicating that. 
with the opening scene of the Turtles fighting foot soldiers, the opening credits, a stylistic homage to that urban Frank Miller aesthetic that informs both properties, and a wonderfully thrilling Batman Shredder fight, followed soon after by a zany but equally well-choreographed and exciting Batman Ninja Turtles fight. It's refreshingly escapist fun. And it's not mindless. The story makes sense, and it's intelligently and competently written. It just doesn't have the loftiest of story goals. It wants to be fun, and the people making it are clearly enjoying themselves trying to make that happen, so that's infectious. And when it's over, I kind of just want to get back on that theme park right again. The main challenge for a crossover like this is striking a balance between the two tones of each world and making sure neither property takes over. That there's equal fun to be had for fans of both. And the sweet spot is when they both fit together so well, it feels like one single property. One world that both occupy space in. That's harder to do in an interdimensional crossover thing, where one world literally intrudes on another, and the most intelligent move this film makes is sidestepping the alternate reality stuff entirely. These aren't two pre-existing worlds that collide, but one new one that happens to include Batman and the Turtles, each in a different city. We don't have to spend a long time listening to a technobabble explanation for how one wound up in the other dimension, or make the main conflict about how the Turtles are going to get back to their world. Instead of the interdimensional portal device as the MacGuffin, like in the comics, here, it's a cloud seeder, which Raza Ghoul and the Shredder plan to use to sprinkle anti-ooze, or mutagen, as Batgirl insists on calling it, in an unfunny running gag I don't understand, to turn the Gotham citizens into mutates. I think this succeeds at finding that sweet spot. Though again, these franchises do fit together perfectly, so that's maybe a little easier than some other things you might cross, like the Power Rangers Justice League comics. The sweet spot was most definitely not found there. I see this as a Ninja Turtle story told on Batman's turf, except without any kidnapping plot at all, which is unusual for a classic TMNT story. It's more of a high-flying adventure than a detective story. It's less talky and broody than your average Batman story. It's kind of a video game plot, like a lot of Turtles cartoons, but the majority of the cast is from Batman's world. Oddly, none of the Turtles' supporting allies are here, even though they made appearances in the comics. No Splinter, Casey, or April. And so, again, no one to get kidnapped. And the last two aren't even referenced, unless the calendar showing the month of April in the Turtle Van is a reference to the character. It is a missed opportunity not to see Splinter and Batman trade martial arts and discipline notes like they do in the comics, but then a little harder to get him here in a road trip than by way of interdimensional portal. In every iteration, Splinter is old, doesn't get out much, and doesn't go on missions he doesn't have to. And sacrificing him to get away from the old interdimensional cliché is an okay trade-off. The movie tries to have fun with the turtle stuff affecting Batman's supporting cast, so like in the comics, we have the fanficish notion of mutating the Arkham inmates into appropriate animals. Scarecrow is a crow, and Joker is a snake, I guess because he shoots people with his acid flower and poisons them with Joker toxin, and he's unpredictable like a cobra. I appreciate that we have a limited number of Arkham inmates, and we don't bring in, like, you know, 115 characters like the comics kind of try to. In the comics, that seemed like a novelty shoved in for little reason, and like everything, it's here because the movie thinks you'll geek out over it, but it's better woven into the story. Joker gets a vial of ooze in exchange for his Joker toxin formula. I don't know what determines what you turn into. You don't have to mix this ooze with animals to mutate anyone. No trips to the zoo like in the book. It just does it on its own, affecting people in whatever way the script likes, like Kryptonite in Smallville. And this is neither here nor there, but it just occurred to me that zoo is ooze spelled backwards. Weird. Far more of the fun references are to Ninja Turtles things than Batman things, despite the whole thing taking place in Gotham, like Donatello saying Bossa Nova from the 1990 movie, and all the Playmates toy references, like the turtle van that throws pizza discs, combining the party wagon with the pizza thrower, I had both, and complete with that visor piece on the front that was always falling off of the toy. Hilariously, it comes off in the movie. 
Yeah, this is one of those things that felt like it was made just for me. Curiously, the main theme, written by Kevin Riepel, who most recently scored Superman Man of Tomorrow, plays most often when Batman shows up in a scene, but it sounds decisively like more of a Ninja Turtles theme to me. I hope this gets sequels, but I would love to see an IDW series spinoff with these exact turtle models and voices, with that simple six-note melody as its theme. The turtles invading Batman's space and lightening it up, even as Shredder makes it more foreboding, is a great trade-off, and I would like to see a follow-up do the opposite. A more involved detective story may be a mystery in the turtles' backyard. This is a Saturday morning cartoon for adults. I can't quite say it's like Batman Brave and the Bold, where it's what a kid thought he was watching when he saw 60s Batman, because that show is still really wholesome and works 100% with a younger age group, like the Adam West show did, while the innuendo and satire went over their heads, and they appreciated that stuff more if they watched it when they were older. It would be more accurate to call Batman vs. Ninja Turtles what middle-aged adults would make if they tried to recreate the Batman and Ninja Turtles cartoons from the 90s for themselves. Writer Marley Halpern Grazer isn't trying to add back in all that substance we filled in with our imaginations as kids with Ninja Turtles, or to even bring in the pathos and heart of Batman the Animated Series. His script is a loving return to the silliest of cartoons from the era I grew up in, but without the censorship that held back the violence and the dialogue. So the plotting is still a little cookie cutter though smarter than any given episode of the 87 Turtles show. The villains are two-dimensional, or I guess they could have a third dimension. Again, who knows what's motivating Roz, but the audience never sees it. The overall tone is darker and grittier, and there's some graphic violence and a little language. And what little superficial adult stuff is here is the only thing holding it back for being for all ages. There is nothing whatsoever about the story that's inherently for a grown-up audience, except the fact that Shredder and Roz actually kill people. But there's plenty of implied killing in various incarnations of both properties that are aimed at kids, like the 2003 Turtle Show and Batman the Animated Series. Remember the Phantasm? Your angel of death awaits? This is not a serious narrative with heavy adult subject matter. We're not looking at the Dark Knight or Watchmen here. We've got Polar Bear Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy turned into a huge Venus flytrap that can't reach our heroes, so they beat her by just walking around her. And the turtle van is throwing giant metal pizzas out the top. This thing is a toy commercial that actually has some toys, which look great but are freaky expensive, aimed at the audience it knows will care. 30-somethings guys who grew up with this stuff. It's like adult collector toys. Everything about it looks like it's for kids, but that's not actually who it's intended for. In this case, though, I think that's a mistake, because a lot of today's kids still keep the Batman and Turtles toy juggernauts moving and are likely to enjoy and want to see a cool crossover movie about them. So you're risking alienating younger kids by making some parts of this too rough and scary. I'm thinking about Roz beheading that guard at the asylum and that brutal, slow-motion, bloody Dark Knight Returns mutant face. Although that's fun. The turtles are mutants, so throw in a Miller mutant. And a ninja star in a foot soldier's face. Now I get it. The movie has a PG-13 rating, and it definitely doesn't push that rating any farther than a lot of live-action movies, even some Marvel films like Winter Soldier and Black Panther. If parents are paying attention to the rating, they shouldn't show this to little kids until they look at it first. And I get the temptation to get as violent as our imaginations might have been when we were kids. In the early 90s, I remember all my friends having this fascination with anything their parents were afraid would desensitize them from violence. It's one of the reasons Spawn was so popular. It was for adults, and we weren't supposed to read it, but it had action figures and appealed massively to the same kids that were buying Batman figures. There was this mystery and allure to it which captivated me, along with a lot of the other kids I knew. Spawn and Batman crossed over in comics, too, and really early in Spawn's run. And that didn't just homage Miller, he wrote it. But I'm getting off track. My point is, those graphic moments are few and far between, and the vast majority of this is totally appropriate for kids, at least by the time they're seven or eight. And so those few rough moments are jarring and out of place to me. 
and I don't think it's missing anything without them. Would adult viewers have really complained if this movie with penguin thugs right out of the Adam West show and constant references to the 87 Turtles cartoon intro wasn't brutal enough? Like, you just can't take it seriously if there's not blood anywhere? Isn't the overall tone and the pretty visceral fisticuffs implied or off-screen brutality enough? And there is some off-screen stuff, also in the scene where Roz and Shredder break into Arkham, and I think it's far more effective. I like that it isn't concerned with making everyone happy, but I actually think it's selling itself short. Without those unnecessary shock moments, it's maybe more accessible than the filmmakers give it credit for. I also think it sells itself short as an adaptation. It's oddly humble in the opening credits. It says it's inspired by the miniseries by James Tinney and the Fourth and Freddie Williams the Second, but it's more of a direct adaptation than some of the DC animated movies based on specific material, like Hush. It's unusual to see that credit on a movie that lifts entire dialogue exchanges and scenes verbatim, like Michelangelo skateboarding in the mansion and knocking a stack of pizzas out of Alfred's hands, and that full-page spread with Mikey riding the dinosaur that's kind of ruined in the book to me by the huge word balloon where he says, this is everything I have ever wanted in my entire life. He says that here too. He goes farther in this version though, he's wearing a bat cowl this time, maybe because Splinter isn't there in this version to tell him to respect the possessions of the man whose home they've just broken into. This is a perfect example of how to translate material that worked well in one medium into another where the initial approach may not be served as much by the new medium. Some of these take too many pointless and uncreative liberties, like Death of Superman and Reign of the Superman, and some don't take enough creative license and are too faithful to the source material, like Batman Year One, where there's things that work great in the comic that just don't translate well, particularly some of the dialogue. Batman vs. Ninja Turtles isn't the same story, but it integrates most of the major scenes and ideas into its own narrative, moving a lot of things around to come out of the gate swinging. It wastes no time getting to that exciting Batman Shredder battle, for instance, and even moves some earlier scenes much later, like the scene where Shredder gains the Penguin's loyalty by murdering his men and telling him he's not getting paid. It also brings Damien in the first act when the Turtles find the Batcave instead of much later in the story, like in the comics, which helps it feel tighter because we're not still introducing allies halfway through. Robin doesn't contribute a lot besides helping out in fights, and it's odd that in a story involving the League of Assassins, he provides exposition about Raza Ghoul, but says nothing about his own connections to the League, namely his mother being Talia al Ghul. It sometimes feels like it's going out of its way to keep characters archetypal or two-dimensional, like a Saturday morning cartoon. The Turtles never say anything about their previous encounters or sordid history with the Shredder, and Batman never once says anything about the death of his parents. Probably the reason it's inspired and not based on is because it's not interdimensional. And while I love the choice to move away from that here, it did create a natural ticking time bomb and sense of urgency that's missing from the movie. In the book, the turtles are in danger of demutating the longer they're in Batman's dimension because the mutagen is a substance that can't retain cohesion for long in that dimension. It's a conceit that raises the personal stakes for the turtles. Without that in the movie, it's just a fun road trip and a routine Stop the Shredder story. For a minute, it looks like the movie might replace that threat with the retro mutagen, which Batgirl says has a 40% chance of killing the turtles if they got it on them. It's designed to revert people who have been mutated back into regular people and may have no effect on the turtles, but she's not sure. I thought maybe Shredder would get his hands on it and try to use it on the turtles or something, but that's dropped as a potential problem. And with that ticking time bomb goes Raphael's motivation for not trusting Batman in the comics. He and his brothers are dying, and Raphael thinks Batman doesn't care and has no real motivation for what he does, apart from being an eccentric billionaire, which leads to Batman taking him to Crime Alley and explaining why he understands the importance of family and the respect he has for Splinter as a father caring for his sons. It's touching and creates a real bond between Raphael and Batman. It's probably the best scene in that first mini, and I really miss it here. 
taking this on its own terms, it functions as a fun romp and doesn't need it, but it clearly would have given the movie more heart and elevated the relationships. But it's harder to make Raphael mad enough that Batman would open up to him like that without that kind of immediate threat. And I'm not sure how you could have created that without resorting to the interdimensional conceit. But again, the details of the plot are all improved here, particularly the villain motivations. In the comics, Shredder just wants to rule Gotham because he found it and he thinks he can, and he plans to keep a portal between two dimensions open so he can have both. A plan that quickly breaks down and he tries to settle just for Gotham. And Roz is only involved because the League of Assassins isn't going to stand on the sidelines while some other ancient ninja group swoops in and takes the city he's been trying to destroy forever. In the movie, Roz and Shredder are already working together from the beginning. Some true in Matus rest in an action-driven superhero story for a change, rather than that annoying cheat where you start with a big fight and then you roll time back to where the story actually begins. The comic even pulls out that tired trick itself a couple issues in, where we see Batman working with the turtles, and then it jumps to two hours earlier so we can see them fight in the Batcave and then decide to work together to catch up to where we already know they're gonna be. Man, I hate that. I have never understood what that does, except make the reader impatient. Anyway, in the movie, Roz and Shredder have clear individual goals, and each get something concrete from their alliance. Roz wants to destroy Gotham, and Shredder has the mutagen that can transform Gotham citizens into mutates, so they'll tear each other apart. Mixing it with Joker's toxin, which is a throwaway idea in the first miniseries that the movie takes and runs with, and in exchange, he promises to give Shredder a Lazarus bit. Of course, Shredder secretly plans on absorbing Roz's army into the foot when an opportunity presents itself, but Batman and the Turtles thwart him before he can, and who knows if Roz would have ever given him a pit, but their team-up is simple and not clunky like it kind of is in the book. Oh, and speaking of Roz, the movie can't decide how to speak of Roz. Shredder pronounces it like the animated series, and the way it's traditionally considered correct, Raish. But everybody else says Roz like in Batman Begins, which is why I pronounced it that way this whole review. I don't know how that gets past a voice director. Different projects have different characters saying it in different ways, but I have never heard both in the same movie. But this movie has another first regarding voice actors, and this one is on purpose. It's the first movie to see Batman and Joker both voiced by the same actor, Troy Baker, who does a lighter, somewhat more brave and the bold take than his nuanced performance in the Telltale Batman series of Batman. And of course, you cannot tell that both of these characters are the same guy. His Joker has always been a more cartoony take, kind of a more over-the-top Hamill impression, which he first did in Assault on Arkham and then the Batman Unlimited movies. And as little character substance as we have here, there's like nothing in those. I might have to review all three of the Batman Unlimited movies in one review. Both the comics and movie see Batman and the Turtles mistakenly believing they're on opposite sides and having that obligatory superhero-on-superhero superhero fight writers always think fans are desperate to see realized. Like, the reason we want to see them crossed over is so that they can punch each other a bunch. And then they team up when they realize it was all a misunderstanding. That's less forced with this material in both mediums than in a lot of other crossovers. Batman thinks the Turtles are monsters the Shredder is using to do his dirty work. And I mean, he's not far off. That is a thing Shredder does. The Turtles just don't happen to be his mutated minions. And the Turtles think Batman is working with the Shredder because he's also a dark ninja-looking guy hiding in the shadows, theatrically dressed to intimidate. I like how they're both done a disservice by the fact that they look so intimidating. It's nice that we get that out of the way relatively early, and both fights on the street and in the Batcave are a lot of fun. I'm into those scenes because of the impeccably paced storyboards. I love the contrast between the intensity and the blow-by-blow -blow exchange in the Batman Shredder fight versus the more playful and gadget-laden Batman Turtles fight. If the Shredder hadn't had such grandiosity, and the movie wasn't playing the world so straight there, with that wonderful reference to the 1990s movie, where Shredder drops down on scaffolding in slow motion like he does on the roof in that movie, wearing essentially the 87 cartoon costume and somehow making it look intimidating and completely badass, 
I might not have been on board with this as quickly. I needed that before Batman fights the Turtles. I also like the look of this movie more than Freddie Williams' comic art, which I've always thought looks a little too storybookish. This is stylish and eye-popping, and I love that the turtles each seem to be modeled after a different sort of turtle, and are drawn almost in totally different styles. Raphael looks like he was designed by Mike Mignola, but nothing else in the movie does. I am really sick of these things using verses to sell product, like the promise of a fight sells more copies. That was insanely gimmicky with BVS, and I couldn't believe an ostensibly serious live-action movie was taking a page out of the direct-to-video marketing playbook. But at least Batman and Superman are at odds most of the movie, and the big fight happens in the third act. Even if that still has that standard, oh, it was all a misunderstanding, let's be friends cop-out, and the reason they're suddenly friends is one of the weirdest and unearned moments in movie history. Some of these deserve the Versus title more than others, like Justice League vs. Teen Titans, but this one really doesn't warrant it at all. It's as much Batman vs. Ninja Turtles as the comic is, and that doesn't have Versus in the title. I want each entity on the other side of a Versus title to be the antagonist for the other, through most of the story, even if they do shake hands and say good game at the end, and maybe even have some kind of interesting ideological argument. Here the argument is... I think you're the bad guy. The first act plot point is basically, oh, I was wrong, let's stop the bad guys together. To be fair, there is a little interpersonal conflict between the two sides just before the third act, but it goes as fast as it comes and is resolved in an easy speech by Raphael, which is 12 times less interesting than the confrontation he has with Batman in the comics. Here, in the closest thing we get to character growth for anybody, Batman refuses to continue to work with the Turtles for all of a minute and a half, saying they're too impulsive because Raphael rushes in half-cocked at the asylum against the Joker, ignoring Batman's warning. And it turns out to be a Dark Knight-esque trap where the alleged hostages turn out to be time bombs. And because of that, Joker is able to get close enough to Batman to hit him with his Jokerized mutagen and turn him into a man-Batman, which is a super cool image reminiscent of the transformation toward the end of Grant Morrison's Batman Incorporated. But Raphael tells Batman that he's always running off on his own without listening to his brothers. It always bites him in the end, and if Batman doesn't mentor the Turtles, they won't learn nothing. He basically says he never learns from his mistakes, and if Batman doesn't trust them, the Turtles will never get better. I don't know why he thinks that will matter to Batman, who just met the Turtles and sees them as a liability. But because it's time to get to Ace Chemicals and have the big final showdown, Batman says, you're right, and now that conflict is resolved. That's the closest to more verses you get the rest of the movie. But because the thing doesn't take itself very seriously, it's surprisingly easy to overlook moments like that and still have a good time. I'm not turning my brain off. I know it makes no sense that Batman buys that argument, and I don't love the Turtles relegating themselves to incompetent sidekicks just to stay in the movie, even after Leonardo acts like Batman is the one who's been holding them back from going after the Shredder. But the movie consistently has those cartoon priorities, and I'm somehow less frustrated by that kind of thing than I usually would be. The moral of the story is tacked on and obvious, teamwork and family, and a team is the same thing as a family. But it's less relatable and meaningful than the obligatory lesson in the average episode of a 2012 Turtles episode, and I think the movie would have been better not to go there at all. Batman has to learn to work better with others, I guess even if they prove themselves to be liabilities, and they all succeed together because they go to Ace Chemicals with a real plan. The Turtles cooperate with Batman, and they jump in when he says the code word Kawabunga instead of whenever they feel like it. But does Batman really learn anything? And yeah, most Batman stories are about his refusal to change, but this doesn't play that way. This acts like the Turtles actually kind of taught him something. He wants the Turtles to follow orders, his way or the highway, and that is exactly what they do. And early in the movie, when Batgirl wishes Batman would trust her with more responsibility instead of sidelining her, he asks her to help with research. It's not field work, but then he doesn't send her home at the end during the big car chase when she's driving that awesome 60s-inspired Batgirl cycle, and that has nothing to do with Raphael's speech. 
So it seems to me like he's proving he's already willing to be a team player and just doesn't want a bunch of dumb kids to accidentally get him turned into a giant bat creature. It's hard not to see Batman as in the right here in really the whole movie. Also, the movie rewards the turtles both for using their heads and for being impulsive, because Michelangelo solves two major problems single-handedly by pressing a lot of buttons and being destructive. He gets rid of a lot of the foot soldiers by pressing every button in the Batmobile and shooting a ton of missiles and projectiles every which way during that wonderfully absurd car chase with the dinosaur wearing a foot hood. And let's face it, that is the kind of nonsense we're really here for anyway. I'm not sure why Batman needs fireworks that make a bat symbol in the sky, but okay. Michelangelo stops the Cloud Seeder, Shredder's ultimate weapon, by bashing all the consoles until it shuts down. I don't know. It seems like sometimes Raphael's earlier strategy is the correct one. I guess when it's appropriate is up to what the script needs to happen next. In that Cloud Seeder scene, it's fun that Michelangelo and Donatello drop out of the sky onto a Gotham blimp, as a nice payoff to Mikey's obsession with the pointlessness of those toward the beginning. Because Gotham is bonkers, yo! Interesting they interact with one, given the blimp stuff at the end of Return of the Cape Crusaders. I swear, someone must have been involved in both of these things, but I haven't found any names that worked on both. I was a little disappointed that a way wasn't contrived to include the turtle blimp somehow, considering this goes to the original cartoon so often, and it keeps talking about blimps. Oh, and Ninja Turtles 2014 and Out of the Shadows? This is how you integrate that nostalgic, goofy cartoon stuff. Those movies make it awkward and lame, with the exception of Bebop and Rocksteady. They can't decide how serious they want to be, and sometimes seem to almost apologize for going there. This is unabashed, and the characters play it completely straight. It's going to be even harder to go back to Out of the Shadows when I eventually review that, now that we have this. At the end of the day, the name of the game here is fun. It's often sharp-witted, with cool references to things even apart from these two franchises. I think my favorite line in the movie is when Raphael says at the asylum, Hey, creature, leave those kids alone. One of the real treats of the movie is getting to see Baxter Stockman as a fly again and does in an homage to the film The Fly with a really good Jeff Goldblum sound alike. Stroke of genius. And it has a lot of fun with the nature and physics of turtles, which TMNT stuff doesn't always play enough with, like the way they swim and not just popping their heads back on their shells, but getting all their limbs inside to protect them completely. I'm not sure if a turtle shell is durable enough to withstand Bane trying to break Donatello's back, but it's a fun reversal. And I wondered if that wasn't a nod to the ostensible death of Donatello from the IDW comics. And before we get to my rating, let's find out what some of the viewers had to say with tweet-linked reviews on Patreon. Chewbacca's lover, better than the book in some ways. It was pretty good, although not exactly what I wanted from a Batman TMNT crossover. I didn't need the Batman villains becoming mutants. Bag Studios, epic. Kinda wish it was 03 and Batman TAS. Oh well, the best Batman fight, Bats vs. Saki. Humor always works. Most I ever liked Babs or Damien, and really creative with parallels. I do wish Splinter came. Compare Batman and Son and Rat and Sons. Feels authentic. Only big goof, Bruce berating Team and T is contrived. Three out of four. Malik Myers, a fun and wacky crossover of properties I really enjoy, and of course, Troy Baker yet again shows his incredible voice acting talent by playing not just Batman, but also the Joker. I loved him as Batman in the Telltale games, and he is just as good here. From Roger Lee, the filmmakers seem like they had so much fun making this, and the effort is apparent from start to finish. The film works as a great love letter to these two franchises, and also shows how well these worlds can fit together. Also, great art style and animation, 3.5 out of 4. And Saqib Tariq, the performances were great from Troy Baker and the rest, one of the better recent DC animated movies. It had such a fun vibe to it. It gave me a lot of nostalgia for the franchises together. 3 out of 4. 
I get the feeling this director and writer found it refreshing to work on something outside of DC, even blended with Batman. And maybe that's why it's so much more of a Turtles movie. Like it was fun for them to let something different invade the space they've played in quite a bit. Director Jake Castorina has directed a number of these DC animated movies, and not all things I've loved, like The Killing Joke, Gotham by Gaslight, and Hush, so he's been around the block with Batman. There's tons of reverence for both properties, and it's treated like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity it handles with care, careful not to squander the moment. It effortlessly makes me smile, scene after scene, as it screams, how didn't this exist until just now? It has one of the coolest closing credit sequences I've seen, with brilliantly drawn mashup covers of classic Batman and TMNT comic covers all the way down. And the best kind of sequel tease in its after credit stinger, where Batman has, of course, dropped Shredder in a vat of chemicals and transformed him into a new Joker. Something totally original for this movie that it didn't borrow from the comics. Although, there is a Joker Shredder of sorts in Batman Ninja Turtles 3, which came out later. It's not a great story, but if something's gotta be made entirely for the sake of fan service, this is what that should look like. I'm giving Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles a 3 out of 4. Ba, ba, ba. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Really hope you enjoyed this one. I had a lot of fun going back to this and sinking my teeth into it. I got some comments last time about a mistake I made at the end of last review during this section where I accidentally said that this movie came out in 2009 instead of 2019. That's what I get for doing this part off the cuff, and you'll have to excuse my voice. I'm recording this a few days after I did the main review, and I have thrown my voice out a little bit. But anyway, let's go ahead and rate this episode on the master list. Letterbox.com is where I'm doing this, and the link to my list is there in the description, both on the podcast feed and on YouTube. And I've got to put this, of course, in the three-star section. So I think I'm going to put it between Superman 2 and Kick-Ass. Uh, so it's going to be the new 55 spot, which might seem a little high. And looking at it compared to some of the two and a half star movies, it's a little bit weird that it ends up sitting as high as it does. But I really don't see putting it any lower. I don't think that uh, The Phantom is necessarily better than this movie. And I don't think that any of those bottom three star animated movies are really better than Batman vs. Ninja Turtles, uh, Crisis on Two Earths, Ultimate Avengers 2, Hulk vs. Is Wolverine. I like those movies. I think this one is a smidge better than that, but not quite as good as like the Batman versus Dracula. If you'd like to support Superhero Rewind and Geekvolution at large, you can go to patreon.com slash geekvolution. At the bottom $2 tier, you get access to early episodes of Superhero Rewind and other fun Geekvolution perks there. At the $5 tier, you can put in tweet-linked reviews and become a member of the Secret Superhero Screen Society on Facebook, and you'll also get an invite to the Discord. And at the $10 tier, you can become a Patreon producer. And I would like to say thanks, of course, to all of our patrons, but individually our producers right now including Iron Bat 1993, Zach, Wendell Jones, Victor, Nick Manna, Nicholas Morgan, Michael Micheletti, Michael Gulick, Kareem Roberts, Jacob Schneider, Damon Begay, CM Productions, T Edge One, The Day Ghost, Stone Gasman, Lone Wolf Jedi of Gotham, Kevin, Carl Maxey, Bag Studios, Josh Hughes, John McLean, Ian McKee, Elliot Slater, Dylan Muschiello, Chewbacca's Lover, Caleb, Azim, and... Red Bandit. You guys are wonderful. Really appreciate you. And I'll see you again with another one real soon. Oh, you're uh, wondering about the next review. What is it? When is it coming? Oh, you know. You've seen the signs. Batman, Superman, World's Finest. Batman vs. Ninja Turtles. Ding dong. The bell's already been rung. And it cannot be unrung. It's long. And it's coming. Soon. Ding 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 ding. Ding 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 ding. Ding 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 ding.